Hello, my name is Stephen Phillips and I'm the North Team Manager of the FAA's Airspace and Procedures Team in the Central Service Center located in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'll be your moderator for today's meeting. Welcome to the second of two FAA meetings on the proposed modifications to the Chicago Midway International Airport Controlled Airspace. We're meeting to solicit comments on the current proposal's effect on local air traffic operations. Today, the meeting will start with an FAA presentation of the proposed Chicago Midway International Airport Class C redesign, followed by presentations from individuals that pre-registered to present at today's meeting. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom, your microphones are muted and cameras are off. Afterwards, we will open the meeting for a 30-minute question and answer session for all attendees via Zoom and the FAA social media platforms. To submit a question during the Q&A session, please place your question in the Q&A tab on the Zoom platform. If you are attending this meeting via a social media channel, please click on the Q&A link in the comments section to be directed to our Google form. If you're having technical issues connecting to the virtual meeting, you can text our tech support number anytime during the workshop. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to the FAA's airspace meeting on the proposed modifications to the Chicago Midway International Airport controlled airspace. The FAA is considering the redesign of the Midway Class C airspace to increase the margin of safety between aircraft landing at Midway and aircraft flying visually along the Lake Michigan shoreline. The purpose of the meeting is to solicit comments on the proposal's effect on local aviation operations. Please note that the proposed modifications will not affect the number of aircraft in the area or the flight class of existing air traffic. Instead, this modification is designed to assist air traffic controllers in separating arrival traffic to runway 22 left from general aviation traffic on the Chicago Lakeshore. This will be made possible because aircraft that conflict with arriving aircraft under the existing airspace design would be required to establish communications with ATC prior to entering the new shell which gives controllers a variety of options to ensure separation. Alternatively, transiting aircraft could opt to maneuver slightly to remain clear of the shelf, which would place them in a position which would preclude conflicts with arriving aircraft. As a result, the proposed modifications will increase safety by reducing the risk of conflicts between aircraft. The FAA will collect and consider all comments on this proposal, and we encourage you to send in your comments. You may do so by addressing them to Christopher Sutherland, Manager, Operations Support Group, Central Service Area, and sending them to the addresses provided on the screen. Please include Midway Class C in the subject line and submit your comments no later than Friday, October 29th, 2021. Your comments will give us valuable input. The FA will review these comments and could modify the proposal based on their content. The final version will be published in the Federal Register as a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. I will now pass it to Al Qualiardi, Support Manager of the Airspace and Procedures Team of Chicago TRACON, to begin the presentation on Midway's Class C airspace redesign. Hello, I'm Al Qualiardi, Support Manager of Airspace and Procedures of Chicago TRACON and today I will be providing an overview of Chicago Midway Airspace in the proposed Class C redesign. Chicago and Midway International Airport is a major commercial airport located eight miles from the Chicago Loop. It has an FAA controlled tower that normally handles more than 230,000 takeoffs and landings every year. The level of activity makes Midway the second largest airport in the Chicago metropolitan area in the state of Illinois. In 2019, it served almost 21 million passengers, making it the 29th largest airport in terms of passenger count in the United States, and a critical part of the United States national airspace system. Chicago Midway is an older airport that was built in 1927. Its runways were built to take advantage of the prevailing winds in the area. Aircraft take off and land into the wind, and today, the runways at Midway are treated as two separate surfaces, you will see numbers on the runways, and those numbers indicate the compass heading the aircraft is facing if it lands or takes off. For example, at Midway you will see runway 4 right, 2 to left, which is 40 degrees in one direction and 220 degrees in the other. Parallel runways that have the same headings carry the designation L for left or R for right for further identification. 
The movement of aircraft in Chicago Midway is handled by FAA Air Traffic Control. The FAA directs traffic through three-dimensional airspace, which are divided into airspace classes. Controlled airspace includes classes A, B, C, D, and E, and uncontrolled airspace is identified as class G. For our purposes today, we'll discuss and focus on class C. Class C airspace can be modified to fit the needs of a specific airport. It typically extends from the ground surface to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation. The lateral boundaries are normally designed as two concentric circles centered on the airport. One circle has a surface area with a 5 nautical mile radius, and the other circle has a shelf area with a 10 nautical mile radius. Radio communications with air traffic control must be established prior to entering the airspace. Aircraft using Midway International Airport include passenger jets, business planes, and general aviation aircraft. Most of these aircraft fly under instrument flight rules, or IFR, and are required to fly on courses and at altitudes prescribed by air traffic control. Some private aircraft fly under visual flight rules, or VFR, which means they must remain clear of clouds and that their courses and altitudes are determined by the pilot, with certain exceptions. Although VFR aircraft landing at Midway or transiting the Midway Class C airspace must be in communication with air traffic control, the shoreline aircraft which currently conflict with arriving Midway traffic are not in Class C airspace and are therefore not required to establish communications with air traffic control. The chart depicts the current Midway Class C airspace in the current O'Hare Class B airspace. The current Midway Class C airspace, outlined in orange on this map, is embedded under the existing O'Hare Class B airspace, outlined in blue. The current Midway Class C airspace encompasses a 5 mile radius around the airport from the surface to the bottom of the O'Hare Class B airspace, and an additional outer ring beginning 5 miles from Midway to 10 miles from Midway from 1900 feet up to the bottom of the O'Hare Class B airspace. The current Class C airspace has been in place long before the implementation of current satellite-based procedures. Conflicts between instrument and visual flight rule traffic have increased. In order to increase pilots' awareness, Midway Air Traffic Control Tower has developed an outreach program to inform visual flight rule pilots of the new approaches and issue cautionary notices. The current configuration of Midway Class C airspace does not include the final approach course for IFR arrivals to runway 22 left, RNAV, GPS, Yankee, or Zulu, as shown by the purple lines. Aircraft approaching runway 22 left at Midway must use the curved course to avoid obstructions in downtown Chicago. The procedures account for approximately one-third of Midway's annual IFR arrivals. This approach path puts arriving aircraft in airspace that is occupied by numerous smaller aircraft flying by visual flight rules, represented by the blue lines. This creates a potential for separation losses between these aircraft. The Midway IFR rival flight tracks trace a descending path that crosses the Lake Michigan shoreline from east to west. The FAA seeks to add to the current Midway Class C airspace creating a new two-tier shelf in the area east of Midway along the Chicago shoreline. The addition will improve safety by ensuring separation between aircraft. Any changes will include an environmental review in accordance with all applicable laws. Aircraft approaching Midway are lined up into approach paths. Currently, the aircraft on the approach to runway 2 love can and frequently do cross paths with smaller VFR aircraft that fly along the Lake Michigan shoreline as shown in the earlier graphic. Making ATC intervention or the use of onboard collision avoidance systems necessary. The FAA seeks to address these encounters by modifying the Class C airspace to contain aircraft on approach to runway 22 left when those aircraft are within 10 nautical miles of the airport. The FAA has studied this issue extensively and is proposing to change the existing Midway Class C airspace by adding a two-tier shelf adjacent to existing Class C airspace east of the airport. One tier of this shelf would be over Lake Michigan and would extend downwards from the base of O'Hare Class B airspace at 3,600 feet down to 2,300 feet. 
The second tier would be over land and also extend downward from the base of O'Hare Class B airspace, but down to 1,900 feet, aligning with the altitudes of the shelf with the pre-existing Class C shelf to the west. The shelf would start at the intersection of the 5 nautical mile arc in ring in Interstate 290. The boundary would follow I-290 eastbound past the shoreline, continuing east to intercept the 10 nautical mile arc, then extends south until it joins the existing 10 nautical mile arc. This new area would be divided into at the Lake Michigan shoreline as described, resulting in a shelf midway between the 5 and 10 mile arcs. I-290 in the shoreline will serve as visual boundary references, enabling pilots to clearly see where the boundaries would be. The proposed airspace modification would ensure that inbound IFR aircraft enters Class C airspace 10 nautical miles east of the airport and require VFR aircraft to either contact ATC for traffic advisories or remain clear of the new shelf. Pilot education is also a part of this proposal. The Midway Air Traffic Control Tower has developed an active outreach program and will use it to inform visual flight rule pilots of the new airspace. Chicago Approach Control and Midway Tower will also issue cautionary notices. Because of the plentiful visual reference points, VFR pilots will benefit from increased awareness of their proximity to the new shelf. I will now pass it back to Stephen Phillips to tell you about the FAA rulemaking process. Thank you, Al. Any changes to Class C airspace must go through the rulemaking process. Rulemaking is the process federal agencies are required to use to make new regulations. Airspace changes such as this qualify as new regulations. The public has the opportunity to review and comment on the proposed rule and the FAA is required to review and consider every comment. The FAA will pay particular attention to the comments received that contain new information or a new perspective, respond to specific questions the agency asks in the notice of proposed rulemaking document, or offer different ideas on how the agency can accomplish the goals sought through the rulemaking. Once the agency has read and considered all comments, it will decide whether it will proceed with the final rule. The agency may adopt a final rule that is identical or similar to the initial proposal, or it might make changes based on the comments received. I will now pass it to Gregory Hines to describe the FAA's environmental review processes in more detail. Hello, my name is Gregory Hines, and I am the Environmental Protection Specialist assigned to this Aerospace Modification Project. Before any changes can be made to the airspace, the proposed rule must also go through an environmental review, which was required by the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA. NEPA requires the FAA to review potential environmental impacts of the proposed action. The FAA will review public comments and will complete the NEPA process prior to implementation of the proposed airspace modification. The review includes a preliminary technical review, a preliminary environmental review, an internal review, and choice of appropriate NEPA review which could include extraordinary circumstances and significant impacts. I will now pass it back to Steve to go over the next steps for this proposed airspace modification. The next steps in the process will be as follows. Comments will be accepted until Friday, October 29th, 2021. The FA will consolidate and review comments. The FA will consider comments and incorporate pertinent modifications. Publication of Notice of Proposed Rulemaking for Midway Class C Airspace Proposal in the Federal Register. And this notice will include its own 60-day comment period. And finally, the FA will finalize the environmental review. Thank you for watching our presentation regarding Midway's Class C Airspace. Again, we encourage you to send in your comments, which you may do so by sending them to Christopher Sutherland, Operations Support Group Manager at the addresses provided on your screen. Please include Midway Class C in the subject line and submit your comments no later than Friday, October 29th, 2021. Before we move on to those of you wishing to make presentations or participate in the Q&A, uh, by the way, you can start submitting those questions now if you'd like. Um, I'd like to discuss just one sentence in the 633-page document that constitutes our primary air traffic control order. The order is called the 
uh, Joint Order 7110.65, named not surprisingly air traffic control. Uh, the sentence is located in Chapter 2. Chapter 1 is uh, essentially required boilerplate administrative language. Uh, that being the case, uh, the words in this sentence are effectively the very first words in the document that has uh, governed the actions of every air traffic controller since 1976, about 45 years ago. Um, so you can see that the sentence on your screen there now. The primary purpose of the ATC system is to prevent a collision involving aircraft operating in the system. The sentence has gone through a few iterations since 1976. At different times, it's contained language about orderly traffic flows, efficiency, and many other things that are certainly important, but it left it to the reader's imagination as to what the most important job for the FAA is. So for me, what it says now is better. It's more to the point, more to the core of what's the most important value of every air traffic controller who ever pressed a transmit button, or, and everyone else in the FAA who supports the national airspace system. Orderly traffic flows and efficiency are very important and we should strive successfully to maintain the most orderly and efficient air traffic system in the world. But on occasions where efficiency and uh, safety are at odds at each other, which does happen, efficiency takes a back seat to safety in my opinion, and uh, almost as certainly as far as you're concerned too. We prefer, uh, I'll prefer that our planes take a, another lap around the airport rather than have a controller uh, clears to land with another aircraft on the runway, which hasn't accelerated as fast as we needed it to uh, for taking off. So we send you on that lap 10 times out of 10 because of that first sentence in what we call the controller Bible. That's the reason we're proposing this, just that one, to prevent collisions, to prevent even the possibility of a collision. The mix of aircraft in the vicinity of this area is such that we feel we must create the shelf so uh, we can effectively ensure we have prevented the possibility of risky encounters there. Anyway, I wanted to uh, bring that up because it's such an important tenet to those of us in the FAA and uh, I thought the public should know that. For those of you just now joining us, my name is Stephen Phillips, the moderator for this, uh, this evening's meeting. If you're having technical issues connecting to the meeting, you can text our tech support number anytime during the meeting at 949-478-0253. Next, we will hear from those who indicated via their meeting registration that they would like to give a presentation or a comment during this meeting, followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. For the presentations, uh, I will first read the presenter's name, then unmute their microphone in the Zoom webinar. Each speaker may present for up to three minutes, after which we'll move on to the next presenter. Instances of improper language will result in immediately being placed back on mute for the remainder of the webinar. We are only accepting comments today that concern this pro proposal. Our uh, first presenter this evening is uh, Mr. David Anderson. Mr. Anderson, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. I appreciate the. Uh, I appreciate you taking my uh, my uh, questions here. Uh, mainly, what I wanted to do is just present. I had a question about uh, with the airspace. We frequently, I'm with Amway out of uh, Grand Rapids, myself plus some of my uh, other peers in the industry in the uh, in the local area, fly a helicopter going right across Lake Michigan, and uh, we go towards uh, Soldier Field and we continue straight into the uh, the Vertiport right there, right along the uh, railroad tracks. It's a it's a common arrival route for us. We frequently actually pass underneath all of the VFR on the shoreline traffic, unless except for like a police helicopters or Coast Guard, they're usually down a little bit lower as well. But I wanted to see if it would be possible to try and get a uh, included in this, maybe, because uh, I do know there, there is a, a fair amount of helicopter traffic that does the same. It'd be nice to get a, um, a corridor, if you will, uh, maybe under uh, special, uh, special use airspace CFR 93, like they have in New York, where basically corridors so that the helicopters could just uh, get in, Get out and uh, still and still make the common uh, calls just like we just like we do uh, at, at the other uh, congested areas like uh, in the New York area, and that uh, that's the com completion of my uh, of my requests. All right, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, we have a, a group of people in the back room that uh, prepared to do research and, uh, and develop some answers that we don't have access to out here. So uh, we'll get back to you uh, later in the presentation. And if we don't answer your question satisfactorily uh, for you or for the, our remaining two speakers, uh, feel free to uh, send us an email at the email address, which we'll show at the end of the presentation. If, uh, so if we haven't answered your question satisfactorily, please uh, get in touch with us that way. 
So uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Mordecai Levin. Mr. Levin, you have three minutes to speak. Good evening. My name is Mordecai Levin. I'm the executive director of Master Flight Foundation and the 2021 FAA Safety Team representative of the year for the Chicago area of FISDO. My experience in the Chicago Midway Airport airspace began more than 40 years ago. My first 500 flight hours were based at Chicago Midway Airport. Master Flight Foundation commends the FAA for this approach to increase safety, specifically amending the class Charlie airspace surrounding Chicago Midway Airport. This amendment is at least 18 years overdue since the destruction of MIGS Airport when the class Delta surrounding it provided flight following and separation for Midway, especially for approaches to the runway 22 complex, including the 31 circle to land 22 approaches. The proposed bifurcation of the outer shelf area between 1900 and 2300 feet at the lakeshore compromises safety. Therefore, Master Flight Foundation recommends that the Midway's Class Charlie Amendment creates one addition to the airspace beginning at 1900 feet and continues to the overlying Class Bravo airspace. Since January 1st, 2020, the requirement of aircraft flying within the O'Hare Class Bravo 30 nautical mile veil to have an operable ADSB has increased the margins of safety vis-a-vis -vis separating aircraft on approach to Midway. The ATO should make available all Class Charlie and Class Bravo airspace incursions from 360 degrees and to 180 degrees at 15 nautical miles from Midway from January 1st, 2020 onwards. Many of those that transition the airspace east of Midway often avoid interaction with ATC. It's well known among the DPE and CF CFI communities that the pilots are often unequipped and afraid to contact ATC. Some on this call will remember when pilots had only in class golf airports sometimes landed in peculiar ways at Midway, including on the south ramp. Amending the class Charlie airspace presents an opportunity to educate the pilot community and increase ATC communications proficiency. Master Flight Foundation proposes that the FAA creates a new program to replace the Operation Rain Check Program. In addition, we suggest that the FAA coordinates a program conducted every 90 days that conducts a virtual fly-in and virtual com community debriefs of that event. That concludes my comments. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Levin. It was an uh, excellent comments and we'll be considering that in totality with all of the remainder of the comments we received uh, both in this meeting and via email afterwards. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Faizan Abdullah. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Mr. Abdullah, you have three minutes to speak. Good evening. My name is Dr. Faizan Abdullah, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago in addition to being a professor of surgery at Northwestern University. I've also been a private pilot for the last 14 years and have had the privilege of owning three different airplanes for personal and business uses. Firstly, I would like to thank the FAA for the opportunity to participate in this period of public comment as part of its adherence to the federal rulemaking process. The FAA's process, which does its best to support transparency and accountability in serving the public's interests is exemplary and must remain protected. In these changing times, I believe it's critically important for us to support our public institutions and reaffirm our commitments to legal and governance processes which have made this nation great, and also the FAA and our national aviation system the best in the world. It is in this spirit that I request as a private citizen to make a comment tonight. Having reviewed the FAA Chicago Midway International Airport Class C redesign proposal, I must admit on initial review, I had concerns about how the new rule would impact recreational flights for pilots like myself who regularly enjoyed flying up the Chicago skyline under Class Bravo airspace in order to enjoy one of the most beautiful skylines and metropolitan lake vistas in our nation. 
These flights along the shoreline bring so many private pilots joy along with happiness to their families. I can personally attest that I've shared these shoreline flights with many medical and university colleagues who to this day, many years later, treasure the experience and photographs that were able to take during their flight. To protect this freedom and ability to continue to perform such flights, I believe it's critical. However, I now clearly understand the safety concerns that have caused this airspace modification to be put forward. And I can see it will not significantly affect the freedom of shoreline flights, which is why I'm in full support of the FAA publishing a final rule, making this change to the Chicago Midway airspace. Thank you again for the opportunity and privilege of making a public comment. Have a good evening. Uh, thank you for your comments, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah was our final presenter for this evening. Uh, the presenters uh, may submit additional comments via email or traditional mail. We'll have an email address back up on your screen by the end of the presentation tonight. Um, next, we'll move on to live Q&A based upon the questions we are receiving from Zoom and the FAA's social media platforms. If you're on Zoom, please submit questions in the Q&A tab. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, please submit your questions in the respective uh, platform uh, chat area for those platforms. I'll read the questions from the attendees out loud for our panelists to address. And uh, speaking of our panelists, I'd like to take the opportunity now to int introduce our panelists for this evening. First, we have Al Qualiardi, the support manager for airspace and procedures for the Chicago District and Chicago Tracon. Good evening, Al. Uh, good evening, Steve. Um, and good evening to all our guests that have taken the time to attend the uh, public hearing today and appreciate the comments we've received so far. Okay. And next, we have uh, Shree Obert, Air Traffic Manager for the Midway Air Traffic Control Tower. Good evening, Shree. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, everyone. I look forward to our uh, Q&A today and um, glad to be here. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, last but not least, we have Gregory Hines, Environmental Protection Specialist here in the Central Service Center in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. How are you tonight, Gregory? Gregory, you're muted. Sorry about, yeah. sorry about that. That's just how technology works sometimes. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I would like, first like to thank uh, all of our, our guests that spoke uh, and had uh, questions uh, regarding our, our process and uh, look forward to hearing uh, many, many questions uh, throughout the rest of this process. And again, good evening to everyone. All right, thanks, Greg. And you think after a year and a half of uh, COVID and Zoom meetings, we'd all be excellent at unmuting uh, <laughs> your mics, but I, every day I do that. Um, so we received a question yesterday about the RNF RNP approach to runway 22 left. Um, so um, I wanted to um, answer, uh, get an answer uh, to, to that today because it was a good question and I'm going to ask Al to answer it. Um, Al, how many uh, RAs have occurred, resolution advisories, and is there a plan to try and utilize the RNF uh, RNP 22 uh, left runway X when uh, coming from the west? The way over the the way the aircraft never cross over the shoreline that way, the aircraft never cross over the shoreline. You see that on the screen there now. Typically, when approaching from the west, we will get cleared for RNAP RNP runway two two Yankee and get rooted over the lake, crossing the shoreline two times. And uh, what are the impacts estimated to aircraft on the RNP Yankee runway two two left versus the RNP X ray runway two two left? Will this aid in the issuance of uh, the RNP X? <clears throat> there should be uh, no impact uh, to the aircraft on the Yankee or the uh, Zulu, the ones that come straight over the lake. Um, for the RMP X-ray, uh, while the uh, the RMP approach, curved approach from the southwest is uh, a tool that we can use, it's much more difficult to sequence all the aircraft to that particular approach because uh, the greater volume probably comes from the southeast. Um, so anyway, uh, with the numerous RAs along the shoreline, um, I don't have an exact number of uh, MORs that we've recorded, but they're, uh, they're available and uh, with research we can pull them. But at the time we've uh, conducted the staff study, there were 
enough MORs to warrant uh, action on the Plan C proposal that we are talking about tonight. Um, thanks, Al. Um, not sure if everyone knows what a resolution advisory is. I'll just touch on it very briefly. Onboard uh, uh, traffic collision and avoidance system available on most aircraft, and uh, certainly all Southwest Airlines have them. Uh, it, it, the equipment detects that the plane will be coming in, in close proximity to another one. It can generate a resolution advisory. It doesn't mean that the uh, aircraft are about to crash. It's just a cautionary measure on the part of the equipment to get the uh, uh, pilots out of uh, even the possibility of danger. So that's what the, he's referring to there. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, it's uh, airborne equipment that provides um, separation between aircraft some that may not even be talking to aircraft, air traffic control as a survival mechanism that will keep the airplanes separated, uh, but not provide air traffic separation. Thank you. Um, this is another question we received yesterday. We thought that the audience today would benefit from. Uh, this proposed change will push VFR traffic lower and or further out of the lake. This will result in more VFR aircraft forced into a smaller corridor. ATC currently makes uh, transit of the Class C nearly impossible for aircraft not landing at Midway. What considerations are being made for safety of flight issues for VFR aircraft transiting the lakeshore? Three. Yes, Steve. Uh, so as you had stated previously, um, or as Steve has stated previously uh, in our presentations, um, our purpose is uh, prevention of collisions in the national airspace system. And that's the primary purpose of air traffic control system. Um, the purpose for the, pro the proposal is to enhance the ability of air traffic to control to provide um, air traffic advisories and safety alerts to aircraft operating in the airspace. So currently that ability is hindered due to aircraft not being in radio communication with air traffic controllers. And the shells were designed uh, in order to mitigate the safety uh, of these flight issues, um, providing positive control. How does that design uh, provide that? Can you expand on that just a minute? Yes. So um, it, what it does is it provides uh, a separation for the aircraft that are inbound to runway 22 left uh, from the altitude they proceed into um, over uh, the, the final fix. As they're descending, they have to cross it at 3,000 feet, and then they begin their descent. And what happens right now is aircraft that could be uh, in close proximity do not have to talk to air traffic control. So the um, Southwest jets will receive a re or other air carriers will receive a, a resolution advisory and people may not realize that that's required uh, action. So what it does is it destabilizes the uh, approach into the airport causing uh, a go around uh, or uh, unstable approach. So, um, and that's usually a, a high, um, just, you know, it's, it's a kind of a critical phase of flight, I guess we could say. So we want to make sure that that's that we have positive control and that both uh, pilots are aware of and we could possibly uh, do some separation services there. Thanks. So the uh, aircraft are descending to 3000 that landing at uh, Midway, but right now the VFR aircraft are not required to, but they would be uh, in that location to be required to talk to air traffic control or either that or avoid the uh, airspace altogether, which puts them out of the area where they could come in conflict with the Southwest. Is that pretty accurate? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, next question. As a general aviation user, can I still fly along the Lake Michigan City of Chicago coast? Al, you want to start us off on that one? Uh I sure will. The uh, answer is, simple answer is yes. Uh, the shelf will not impact you at all at altitudes below 2,300 feet, but you uh, may need to alter your flight plans slightly to the east or descend slightly to avoid the shelf if you prefer to not communicate with air traffic control or if ATC is unable to let you transit the airspace to, to uh, inbound traffic to Midway. So, uh, as long as you stay below 2,300 feet, you can stay right along the lake shore. Uh, and the 22 left arrivals will be crossing the fix right at the shoreline at 3,000 feet to provide 700 feet separation. Um, so yes, it should not be, uh, it won't be a major impact to traffic transiting the lake shore. So uh, traffic traveling uh, south, southeast along the lake shore, the uh, 
proper altitude to duration of flight for them would be 2,500 feet, correct? Yes. And so yes, they would sir. only need to drop a couple hundred feet to, to miss the airspace if that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shree, anything to add to that? Um, no, not at this time. All right, thank you. And the next question. Um, it seems like there will be a lot more airplanes asking for flight following. Did the FAA study air traffic controller workload for this project? Oh, well, I'll start it out. Um, flight following uh, is a uh, product of, uh, it's an additional service provided by controllers based on workload and other factors. Um, so it won't, it won't it increase the volume of traffic uh, going through the airspace because there's a fair amount of traffic now, uh, especially during periods like the Oshkosh Air Show. Um, so, uh, Advisors will be open on a work permitted basis, workload basis, and um, and it would be mostly from the airplanes that are going up and down the lakeshore. So I don't see a great increase in that. Um, currently, we give flight following as uh, the times available. At, you know, as as we uh, in the world we live in today. So, Sheree, do you want to add anything to that? Um, the only thing I would like to add is that. Um... It, from an air traffic control perspective, especially, uh, you know, as those aircraft are coming in, uh, it, it's our purpose. We, we want to talk to those aircraft if they are going to be uh, within that airspace that we're proposing. So um, we, if, it, and it's a choice, it's a, if a pilot doesn't want to go through there, they, they can certainly go around the airspace or underneath it. So there are choices involved. Okay. Um... Uh, thanks, Sheree. So there, there's nothing about the proposal uh, that would attract any uh, or provide any incentive for any other aircraft to be flying there. Uh, the existence of the airspace, and in most cases, like um, Al and I were just discussing, uh, correct altitude uh, for direction of flight uh, heading to the south southeast is 2,500. So if they want to remain at that altitude, they have the opportunity to uh, have choices, like Sheree uh, was saying. They have the opportunity to talk to air traffic control and remain at their altitude or descend just a couple of hundred feet and fly underneath it or um, alter the path, flight path just uh, slightly out to the east over the lake and uh, avoid the air, um, airspace altogether that way. And next question. Um, when you say uh, conflict between airplanes, what does that mean? Um, it, it simply means the trajectories of uh, two and possibly more aircraft, typically two, are, are such that a, a appropriate separation standards will need to be applied. Um, with the implementation of this shelf, controllers will have twice as many options in terms of applying those separation standards because they'll be talking to twice as many aircraft. They can uh, have the uh, arrival stop at a higher altitude or turn, and they can have the uh, VFR aircraft translating the airspace to send or turn. The, the controllers have several uh, tricks in their little bag, and those are the two main ones, but uh, just the fact that they're talking to both aircraft and uh, know what both aircraft are going to be doing, uh, particularly the VFR aircraft, because those are the ones that, um, I don't want to say cause the problem, but because we're not speaking to them, we can't be completely confident in what they're going to do. There could be, uh, they could decide to turn around and head back the other direction or climb or descend, whatever the people on the aircraft want to do. But, uh, if, we're, if we're talking to them in the Class C airspace, then their flight path will be predictable and stable, and uh, we'll know exactly how to separate them. Okay, um, next question is, um, altitude is always a pilot's friend. Uh, we see more bird strikes at lower altitudes. Did the uh, FAA look at the altitudes of bird strikes? Um, although do we, we do... Uh, Keep record of bird strikes. It's a mandatory occurrence reporting uh, requirement uh, to uh, report those. But uh, there's nothing in this proposal that would make uh, bird strikes any more likely. And uh, in the case of aircraft transiting south southeast, going from 2,500 uh, feet or 1,500 feet to a, a th you know 2,500 feet, 1,000 feet is probably not going to make that much difference. Uh, next question is, um, the area for BFR aircraft along the shoreline seems to be smaller. Will there be more or the same amount of traffic in a smaller geographic area? Sheree, care to comment? Um, 
Sure, certainly. So uh, let's uh, bring up a uh, slide again, referencing this if we could. Thank you. So this slide depicts VFR traffic on the shoreline. Um, there are enough to account for just about all of the documented history reportable conflicts, uh, essentially those that re resulted in re resolution advisories. So um, let me just look at the question again, make sure I'm reading it correctly. So the answer is uh, no, that we will not be having a, you know, the same amount of traffic in a smaller geographical area. There will be pilots that will choose to maneuver around the airspace or go underneath it. And then there will be some pilots just for simple preference, they will choose to go through the proposed new airspace. And if that's the case, they just need to uh, get permission through air traffic control to transverse the airspace and um, then they will be in communication with air traffic control. We had, don't anticipate that this will change uh, or compress airplanes differently uh, than they are now. All right, thanks, Sheree. I'd like to point out that those blue lines there are, represent the flight paths of aircraft between two and 3,000 feet, um, which uh, comprises the majority of the aircraft flying up and down the, the coastline there are. Uh, a good number below that, which will be uh, completely unaffected by this change, and a, a much smaller uh, subset of aircraft that fly above that, and those are the ones that are causing uh, most are involved in most of the conflicts over that uh, area that we're discussing today. Uh, next question: If we could bring up that uh, VFR um, flyway chart, and will the uh, Chicago VFR flyway planning chart be affected? The sectional chart shows a flyway along the coastline that appears to restrict VFR aircraft to 2,500 feet until the Navy Pier, and then 2,000 feet south of that. Why doesn't that solve this issue, Al? Okay, that's a great question. While the flyway does exist as described, the use of VFR flyways is uh, strictly voluntary for pilots. The l 2s VFR uh, aircraft can fly are currently restricted by only the overlying Class B airspace, the O'Hare Class B. And as we discussed, the shelf would require aircraft with flight plans will enter the shelf to either that want to enter the shelf to contact ATC for separation, or uh, avoid the shelf entirely, or uh, have a minor course change. Um, if you look at the VFR uh, fly flyway chart that's depicted. Um, Traffic transiting up and down the lakeshore north of Navy Pier is recommended at or below 2,500 feet, and uh, south of Navy Pier at or below 2,000. Uh, whereas the regulatory airspace that's being proposed uh, is actually 300 feet higher than the VFR flight check currently lists. And again, um, it's not uh, regulated airspace; it's just voluntary. Um, and uh, so, the situation still exists, and the solution really is to. Uh, put in a class C to regulate the out, uh, puts a firm top on the uh, the airspace there. So, um, Shuri, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you covered it. Um, like I said, the other situation doesn't really solve the problem we're having. It doesn't require um, any sort of uh, positive control with air traffic control uh, to uh, ensure that uh, air traffic safety uh, alerts or traffic advisories are being done so everybody is aware of the other. Yeah, we actually we actually pushed that VFR flyway altitude south of Navy Pier um, <clears throat> down to 2,000 from 2,500, and uh, it hasn't solved the problem. So we're looking at uh, mitigating the issue with another step. Okay, thanks, uh, Corby. Would you mind uh, pulling up the, the the chart with the uh, flight pass on it again? Just wanted to point out that echo um, Al's point that uh, it's a recommended altitude, 2,500 north of the Navy Pier and then 2,000 feet south of that. And um, as you can see, there's not that much of an appreciable uh, difference in the number of blue tracks in the 2,000 foot area. So the, those aircraft uh, are taking the voluntary nature of that altitude stratum um, to heart and flying at the altitude they'd uh, prefer to fly instead of the uh, altitudes that are recommended in the flyway chart. Uh, next question, will you correct the misconception of pilots that read the slides that uh, suggest that those that transit outside the Class C airspace obviates the need to have ADSB? All pilots should be reminded that any flight through the lateral boundaries of the 30 mile veil of the uh, Chicago Hair Class B airspace. 
And uh, I'll assure you the one of you. Sure, I'll take it. Um, okay. append, uh, Appendix D of Section One of the uh, of One of Fourteen of CFR Part Ninety One requires all aircraft operating when the mode C veil airspace within thirty miles of the primary Class B airport. Um, must be equipped with an operable radar beacon transponder with automatic altitude reporting capability and an operable, operable ADSB out equipment. So, yeah, that uh, that requirement still exists. It's not uh, doesn't change with this proposal. It's tough to have too many uh, layers of safety. I agree with you. Next question. Uh, will Midway be uh, Midway approach? I, I presume they mean uh, Chicago, uh, Tracon, be willing to extend traffic advisors beyond the airspace boundaries, as is the current policy? This will extend safety for planes operating along the busy lakeshore VFR. Um, Sri, how about you? Well, um, this, this might be more of a, a Chicago Tracon question because um, Midway is actually a, a VFR tower. Um, and for us uh, in, within our airspace, we provide traffic advisories on a workload permitting basis. Uh, for a, a radar facility, I might want to defer to Al on what uh, his thoughts are on that. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is the traffic advisories are permitted on a workload basis. Um, the proposal for the Class C airspace um, is a, a rather significant benefit when we're landing two to left. Now, when we're landing 31 center, four right, or 13 center, there may be opportunities to uh, have uh, additional aircraft transit through the Class C as the controllers uh, can either approve, uh, if they can approve them, due, it's due to our controller workload. So um, we uh, have the capability of doing it, but it, uh, it's all on a workload basis. And if a controller has a time and it's not super uh, complex or busy, they'll, they'll call them and they'll provide VFR advisories. And, and just to follow on that, just to clarify, because I think what the question is asking is, um, would um, we be willing to provide VF, uh, VFR advisories along the lakeshore and not including the airspace? I, if I understand the question correctly, um, and um, that would be, because the class C would be, um, and we, like I said, we haven't really decided how that's gonna play out between the overlying approach control and uh, midway tower and class C. However, you know, further along the lakeshore, which of course can be very congested, uh, that we are actually primarily focusing right now on the IFR um, aircraft that are uh, going on to the local, uh, the um, runway 22 left approach. So um, we haven't really entered into any really, you know, any conversations about that. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, I, think I think so. Okay. Al, anything else to add? I think I think cut, cut you off. Um, no, if they're talking about airspace beyond the Class C, uh, the proposed Class C or the existing Class C, we have aircraft calling us all the time for VFR advisories. You know, southeast of Midway, east of Midway, north of Midway, uh, in that entire airspace. So, uh, call Chicago Approach, and if uh, they can do it, they're going to provide VFR advisories. All right, thank you. Um, our next question in my 30-second uh, Google search didn't help me with this, uh, but I'll, I'll read the question. As a participant of uh, the AIAA, which I'll admit I do not know what that stands for, uh, Airspace Traffic Management Program Committee, I challenge Al's suggestion that this uh, change won't impact traffic. If effective, the increased separation uh, possible by the changes will indeed allow more curved approaches and will increase the capacity via closer spacing of IFR approaches. I encourage the environmental impact personnel to point out the environmental benefits. So uh, I'll go first to you, Al, and then over to Gregory, because he looks lonely over there. <clears throat> OK, um, give me a second here. Uh, what I, I, the way I can address that is by saying that, um, you know, Midway has a finite number of airplanes that can land there. Um, it runaway acceptance and with the uh, existing approaches two two left thirty one center uh, runway four right and thirteen center we really have options from every direction uh, 
excellent options from every direction. Um, we currently have no plans for uh, the development of any of the curved RNAV approaches. Not saying that that won't be considered down the road, but uh, when they are, if they are, everything will be um, vetted by the environmental uh, people that are, uh, they do uh, their due diligence. Um, and they are on top of, uh, they work with the city and they work with all, all the groups that are affected uh, when anything's proposed. And I personally experience they are very thorough. Greg? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Greg, uh, speaking of environmental people. Uh, thanks, uh, Steve and Al. Uh, just to add briefly to what Al just said, um, uh, the purpose of this proposal, of course, initially is to improve safety. But uh, in addition to that, this, pro this, excuse me, this proposal is subject to environmental review under NEPA, and FAA will ass assess every environmental impact uh, every environmental effect rather, and compliance, make sure we're in compliance with NEPA. So that, that will be conducted during this, uh, this uh, process. Okay, thank you. And um, if I could just chime in. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to add that the uh, FAA really doesn't determine the uh, demand or number of operations at, at an airport. Uh, we just develop the, uh, or assist in developing the, the infrastructure to ensure that we can adapt to uh, any changes in operations. Yeah, next question. Um, this is adjacent to the Class C issue, but is there any plan to implement a Chicago shoreline CTAP similar, similar to the Watson Island frequency in Miami? I'm not familiar with the, uh, I'm familiar with Miami, but not in uh, Watson Island uh, or their frequency there. But uh, we haven't, the short answer is we haven't discussed the uh, option at this time and currently uh, as a result are not planning for it, but we're consider any option that may assist pilots in safely navigating outside of Class C airspace or uh, Class B airspace. So, uh, Gregory, I'm going to key you up here. Uh, will uh, the airspace change lead to increased traffic or noise in the area? Thanks for that question, Steve. Um, uh, the existing uh, traffic patterns will not change. Uh, there will probably be an increase in small aircraft flying off the shoreline, slightly uh, lower altitudes uh, than they flew at previously. But this is, excuse me, this increase uh, should be undetectable over land. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you describe the process that will occur after these workshops? I certainly can. Uh, there are a bunch of them. We've done a bunch of them already. Uh, the, uh, the primary ones of these, um, after the comment period ends uh, one month from today, uh, we'll review all input received in its totality, the, the comments tonight, the comments last night, and uh, all the comments were received uh, via email, and uh, modify the proposal as appropriate, if it's appropriate. Uh, then we will send uh, the proposal in whatever form it takes then. Uh, the, the ad hoc committee recommendations and any other materials used in support of this effort. We'll be sending that to the policy division of the FAA's Mission Support Services for their review, which involves uh, not just their review, but they send it out to other uh, divisions to review as well, uh, legal um, among them, uh, just to make sure the, uh, the wording is exactly as it needs to be. So once it's uh, in a final rule, it has to be perfect. It can't be disclosed to it. Um, you know, once that's uh, complete, any, uh, complete, any changes are made, uh, made that uh, become necessary as a result of that review. Uh, notes of a proposed rulemaking is published in the Federal Register, and it has its own 60-day comment period. Um, so after those two months are up and we review uh, those comments that were received through that process, we will again consider modifying the proposal to account for any uh, great ideas that we hear. And that we do hear great ideas on, on those things. We hear great ideas from meetings like this as well. Uh, but if we received any ideas that uh, prompt us to uh, modify the proposal at all, we'll do that at, at that time. And then after that, we'll submit the final rule for publication in the Federal Register and that's at the end of the process. Uh, the next question is, uh, I fly tours of the city. Will I have to establish communications for Class C airspace at Midway? Sheree, what do you think? So if you're going to enter 
and want to transverse through the Class C airspace, that is correct. You need to establish two-way radio communications. If you're below 1900 MSL, you do not need to be in contact with air traffic control. And uh, there will, so there'll be no change from your current procedures. And if you uh, are an entity that regularly works as far as, you know, we have helicopter um, companies and things like that, that do that sort of thing. Uh, it will not affect how you work with us. It's just that you would contact us sooner. So um, depending on where you're coming from, I hope that helps. Okay, thanks. So it's a 1,900 over land and 2,300 feet over the, over the water. Uh, Gregory, back to you. If someone wants to, wants to make a noise complaint, how do they do that? Uh, that's a good question, Steve. Thanks for that question. Um, first, they would need to contact the, uh, the Chicago Department of Aviation will be the first uh, place to stop for noise complaints. And if they wish to file a complaint uh, with the FAA, please, they can go to fa.gov uh, slash uh, noise. And, and there's a wealth of information on this, uh, on that website, on that page. Okay, thanks, Gregory. Um, yeah, FAA.gov is going to contain a lot of information about not just what Gregory was talking about, noise complaints, about but everything related to the process that we're engaging in right now, including these meetings. Uh, there's orders in there and uh, different pages that are dedicated to, to this process. So if you're interested in learning more detail about the process, and I went over the highlights a couple of minutes ago, but if you're interested in more detail, uh, you, you'll be able to find it there. The uh, next question, our second presenter, uh, Mr. Mordecai Levin commented about Operation Rain Check and other options for education. Uh, I'd like to respond to that one for sure. Uh, Sheree, you wanna try that one out? Sure. So at this time, uh, Operations Rain Check is on hold due to pandemic uh, restrictions placed on government facilities and allowance of vis vis uh, visitors. Uh, hopefully this will resume in the future. Uh, there are some facilities out there that have um, reinstated uh, operations rain check uh, off and on. Midway actually hasn't had one in a while, but we actually, we did have um, pilot outreach uh, programs and things. And we've also done uh, local um, local outreaches to the schools and uh, various you know groups uh, to participate about learning about aviation. So we have done some of that work. So it is definitely something that's on the table. Uh, the flight standards FAST team meetings are a good option uh, for any Class C education and Mode C bail requirements. Uh, they're always a great source. And um, this, this will be passed along to flight standards as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I remember Mr. Levin mentioned the possibility of uh, virtual uh, operation rain checks meeting. It seems a perfectly reasonable request to me. So that's certainly something we can uh, dig into. Um, don't know the background of everyone who's logged in today, but just uh, to fill any holes in the knowledge, Operation Rain Check is a program where uh, the local aviation community, primarily pilots who fly in the airspace, uh, can visit an air traffic control facility and see what it looks like on the other side of the microphone and what kind of issues the controllers and managers are facing there in order to uh, not just to meet each other, but to uh, un understand more clearly the pressures that each uh, or, or each entity is under the controllers on one side and the pilots on the other side. And it's been very successful in other places in the past. And to um, add on that, Steve, um, we had a uh, runway safety action team meeting um, in the last week of August on the 26th. And um, there, there was conversation about pilot uh, outreach programs uh, on that and they would be uh, virtual. So that is a topic of conversation locally. Yeah. Difficult to have too much communication when it comes to education too. Um, our first presenter, Mr. Anderson commented about helicopter operations and let's try uh, to answer that. Um, so 14 CFR part 93 deals with special air traffic rules. Uh, helicopter route, uh, mentioned for the New York North Shore uh, states that helicopters utilize the North Shore routes and altitudes as published. Um, at this time, there have been no discussions to make the VFR flyway along the Chicago shoreline mandatory and it hasn't been in the past. And so you, you saw the, uh, the route lines there and we discussed that pretty thoroughly early, earlier. If that doesn't answer uh, your question to your satisfaction, Mr. Anderson, please feel free to drop us an email. 
Uh, next question, please correct that pilots don't need permission. Pilots are required to be in 2A radio communication. Sheree, what do you have to say about that? That, that is correct. 2A radio communications as well as operational transponders are required in Class C airspace. Uh, that does not change at all. Um, just the shape of the proposed airspace shelves. Um, Class C service requires pilots to establish two-way radio communications before entering any Class C airspace. And um, so a clearance into Class C airspace is not the requirement. I'm not, I'm not sure that, that was added on there, but in order to enter, um, there's little notes that they provide us from the back room. I just wanna make sure I had everything there, but the, the correct statement is, is we need to establish uh, ATC two-way radio communication. So essentially, um, if they are, that that's all that's required. So okay, you can't so, unless you talk to us. But we, right. I'm sorry, I keep stepping on you. Sure, go ahead. Are you finished? So you would not. It's, that is correct. You do not need a clearance into the airspace like you would for a Class B. Okay, yeah, that's what was going to be my comment. I'm. Uh, in route by background, so I've never had to do that. But Class B, you have to ask permission to enter and be granted that permission. And then for Class C, just the establishment of two-way radio communication is sufficient for them to enter the airspace. And so uh, if the controller, for some reason, uh, due to traffic or uh, complexity of his current workload, uh, did not want that aircraft to enter the Class C, they would have to, have to say at that time to remain clear. Is that correct? Yes, right. remain outside Class C airspace. Remain, okay. Yeah, you don't it's hard use, to read the question. <laughs> okay. You don't, want to use, you don't want to use the word clear. Right. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, next question. Al, let's go to you on this. Um, how did the FAA decide on 2,300 feet to be the bottom of the shelf? Uh, 2,300 feet was uh, uh, decided upon because uh, it would allow 700 feet between the 3,000 foot fixes. Uh, that are published on the uh, RNAV 22 left, Zulu and Yankee. Um, you know, we had talked about 2,500 feet, to provide 500 feet, which is a separation between a VFR and an IFR, but um, the 500 feet would not alleviate all the resolution advisories for the traffic, for both traffic, for both aircraft. So uh, we, from the recommendations of the, uh, that came through the ad hoc committee, which a collection of uh, Chicago area uh, aviation interests, uh, industry users at Midway, um, and uh, the uh, collaboration of the whole group, the decision was to use 2,300 feet. And I think it's solid. I think it's a, a good good altitude. Yeah, I would, uh, I'd have to agree. I, I was going through some uh, paperwork earlier today and at one point the, um, I don't know if it was the recommendation, but it was a recommendation to have it at 2,100 feet. And I believe during the ad hoc committee meeting, it was uh, General Aviation um, AOPA that uh, argued for something a little higher. And uh, that's uh, we ended up settling on 2,300 feet because 2,100, a uh, little more restrictive than 2,300, but we want to give as much latitude as we can to VFR pilots. Uh, Next question, so I'll just continue on that, 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 on that note. Uh, did the FAA work with general aviation and groups like uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA, to make these changes? And the answer to that is, uh, yes, we did. Uh, as Al mentioned, the ad hoc committee was comprised of a very wide uh, spectrum of uh, aviation stakeholders from the Chicago Department of Aviation to uh, pilots to uh, uh, the AOPA, uh, the ad hoc committee chair was uh, a member of uh, CABA, Chicago Area Business Aviation Association. And uh, so they were in, in very deeply involved and very vocal participants in that. And it was a very positive group and a lot of back and forth, but it was all uh, respectful. And at the end, it came to the proposal uh, you see now, which is exactly as they presented it to us. So uh, we made the initial suggestion to create a class C shelf there, but the proposal as you see it now was uh, a result of the ad hoc committee, which the FAA is permitted by, by law from being a participant in. They were there to serve as subject matter experts and to provide our expertise there. Uh, and we were active in doing so. 
that the uh, we didn't, didn't have a vote, and so the recommendation from the committee was a 2,300 and a 1,900 feet over land and a, on that 10 mile circle, just as you saw on the slide earlier. Uh, the next question uh, looks like it's going to be for Gregory. Uh, besides noise, are there any other environmental considerations? Thanks for that uh, for that question, uh, Steve. Um, the FAA considers several different categories in, in, uh, to include uh, air quality, biological resources, historical and cultural resources, uh, noise, etc. And we encourage uh, anyone that has any uh, comments relative to environmental to submit those comments and we will uh, address them during the environmental process. Thanks, yeah. I um, haven't seen everything that you all work with, but I know that you have some pretty sophisticated uh, equipment and software that you, you use in, in the course of that research. So it's, it will be very thorough, as I think Al mentioned earlier. Um, the next question is, uh, how has the FAA made changes like this at other airports? Um, so, so um, the uh, we did a little bit of discussion about this, and uh, we found that uh, the last time that we can uh, uh, the airspace was uh, made smaller was in uh, Atlanta in 2013, and uh, we're part of that process is we're in what caused it started that process is the FAA is required to kind of biennial reviews of all. Class B, C, and D airspace volume. Sorry for stumbling there. Um, if those reviews indicate that changes need to be made to existing airspace and uh, local air traffic uh, control facilities request, then the FAA can propose changes to the airspace. And that's where most efforts like this uh, are generated from, is those biennial reviews. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but changes such as this have been made in recent years at airports around the, the country. And as time goes by, uh, the um, aeronautic uh, and technological uh, um, devices that are on uh, aircraft or have become more sophisticated and allowed them to do things that weren't possible in the past. So sometimes those inform some changes in the airspace too. Uh, next question, I'll take this one as well. Uh, when do you expect to have this class C in effect? Um, the answer is we don't have any time frame currently established. We're moving along as smartly as we're able to, but um, as we've discussed uh, here and there throughout this evening's presentation, we, they have some mandatory waiting periods for comments, this, these series of meetings being uh, among them. So uh, we'll have 30 days now when we submit the notice of proposed rulemaking, there'll be a 60 day requirement for that. And so it's a little difficult to predict uh, how long it will take because it's impossible at this point to know what kind of rec uh, recommendation and comments that we'll be receiving from members of the public that could inform changes in the design of the airspace or uh, it's considered an outside possibility, but to uh, avoid the publishing of the airspace altogether. Uh, we, so those things like that can uh, significantly hinder the length of time it takes to uh, get a process like this through from uh, start to finish, um, but we're expecting it to take between a year and two years. Um, are there any uh, concerns that this proposed airspace will change, uh, I'm sorry, this airspace change will increase the density of general aviation traffic below 2,300 feet along the lake shore? Sheree? So um, during the previous meetings with the ad hoc committees, um, committee I should say, um, this concern was brought up and considered. So the mitigation of potential uh, conflicts between the arrival aircraft into Midway on the 22, uh, runway 22 left and VFR traffic by this airspace change was also considered. So the committee deemed that the proposed design is best possible, um, proposed design is the best possible proposal to meet both concerns, but uh, essentially um, we, we've, since we have a situation where if a pilot really would like to fly through that airspace, all they have to do is you know, establish communications. We do, we do not um, really foresee an increase of traffic at the lower altitudes. Okay, thanks, Al, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I would say that, uh, well, I'll add just a short piece here about um, the discussions we've had previous to the um, proposals, the initial proposals. Uh, we've had discussions with the ad hoc committee um, we're having public hearings and um, 
Again, we're open to all uh, comments and suggestions that uh, come down and will be, uh, you know, thoroughly vetted and considered. Um, so, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time and due diligence in um, trying to decide what, you know, what is the best for the uh, aviation community and um, the users of Midway and everybody that's involved. Yeah, thanks. Um, next question. Well, this, I guess this is where I get an education. Uh, in route background, I used to work in airspace, uh, airplanes this close to the ground. Um, the question is, I thought at or below 3,000 feet, there was no defined altitude for direction. And it turns out that's correct. Um, the spoke altitudes above 3,000 are subject to um, appropriate altitudes for direction of flight. So my apologies for misspeaking on that. Just a moment where our next question comes up. Okay, um, looks like this will be our final question for today. Uh, when do you expect to have this class C in effect? Can you um, explain this again? I may have missed it before. Uh, as I said, there's there's no uh, current time frame established. We have a mandatory waiting periods for uh, responses to come back for this meeting of 30 days and, and the notice of proposed rulemaking has a 60 day period. And out, outside of that, any changes that are recommended uh, that we decide to implement need a significant study and uh, not just a air, the effect of it on air traffic, but environmental concerns, which Gregory and his team will be heavily involved in at, at that point. Uh, but we're expecting it now to take between uh, a year and two years to complete. Uh, hopefully it'll be less than that though. Okay, so that's a, that was the final question. So thank you for attending this uh, Chicago Midway informal airspace meeting. A uh, recording of this event will be available on the FAA's uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels later this evening. The one from yesterday was up in about 10 minutes, so if you want to take a look then, uh, it should be up. Um, the FAA appreciates your time and comments, and we thank you for being involved members of the aviation community. As I said earlier, our work was made better when we hear your perspectives. All comments received during these meetings will be considered prior to any revision or the issuance of a notice of proposed rulemaking for this airspace. Thank you for attending. This concludes our meeting. Have a great evening.